First, I want to connect the dots between Hole in the Ground and this movie. And I guess maybe where we could start with that is, what would you say surprised you most about the reality of what happens when you have a successful first feature and how that can open the door, give you opportunities, connect you to other people? Yeah, I think it was a great journey, um, you know, with the Hole in the Ground premiering at Sundance in 2019. And whilst I was there, Sam Raimi, had seen The Hole in the Ground at a press screening in LA at the same time. So before I'd left Park City, there had been reaching out, you know, to actually meet up and talk. And then that meeting started this journey that has us kind of sitting in the room today. But it is great with your first feature. Like I think with The Hole in the Ground, it, it, it surprised a lot of people that came out of Ireland, but it had this particular feel and tone that maybe people hadn't seen. And, um, and yeah, there was lots of wonderful conversations that were had with different people. But when Evil Dead Rise poked its kind of gnarly head up over the parapet, that was one that I was going to find very hard to, to not get involved with. So you knew that this was on the table and a possibility back in 2019. 2019. From, from our perspective, I don't think the news broke until like, it might have been like June 2020. June 2020, I think was when, yeah, when, when Bruce had something to say. But at that point, I'd just written the script because it always takes a little bit of time and I was busy. So we kind of just talked about it for a little while. But for me, from July 2019, the guys had said like, absolutely, go, go, go. We want you to go and do this. Okay. And then I just started to de slowly develop and then write the script in 2020. I can always count for the time. And you're like, it's gone by so fast. It really has gone by so fast. Yeah. I have so many questions. The first is, so when Sam Raimi calls you up and asks you if you have any interest in making an Evil Dead movie, if it, like, it feels like a no-brainer. You don't want to pass on an opportunity yeah. like that. But it's intimidating to yeah. join one of the biggest horror franchises out there. So were there any doubts, especially because Hole in the Ground is a very different uh, yeah. feeling kind of horror movie. Did yeah, you know you always had it in you? Yeah, I always want, I, like, when I remember looking back, I, my, my final short film I made, I think it came out like 10 years ago at the same time as Evil Dead 2013. And I remember just being that little bit jealous at the time. And I actually think, funny story, that short ended up, the person doesn't work for Ghost House anymore, but they saw the short and they were like, nah, and they moved along. And I was like, damn, I really want to make an Evil Dead movie someday. Um, and then I got that opportunity, but I didn't actually ever find it overwhelming. I was kind of excited, but I also knew what I wanted and what the guys wanted was to do something that was a little bit of departure, a little bit of a new direction. Um, and that actually brought a certain freedom. It was kind of liberating. Had I been telling a story in the cabin in the woods with Ash, I would have been absolutely terrified. But when I kind of had the creative freedom to tell a story that I was interested in, that Again, it just it just created a certain, I was a piece, it was my favorite script I've ever written, my favorite screenplay. It was so much fun to write. Like every day was a joy, whereas usually I'm just haggard and annoyed when I'm writing. I have Scream on the brain right now, and between that and this, I, ver I feel very spoiled in terms of getting new installments of my favorite franchises that have such like unique, distinct feel. Like they feel part of the franchise, yeah but you also do something different. I feel like if you don't keep doing different things, then these franchises die. Yeah. Very impressed. Yeah, it's it's. I think it's it's just a really good time for horror movies right now, you know. It's always a good time for horror. It seems movies. particularly particularly nice yeah. right now. <laughs> we're, we, we've had a pretty good uh, last two yeah, years at the very we, we've least. We've been dining well. <laughs> um, I want to go back to so many things that just came to mind as you were giving me that answer. First, just because you mentioned your shorts. Is there any hope still for a ghost train feature? Because oh, I love yeah, that absolutely, idea. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, no, I've got, I have a very specific storyline that I've had sitting there for a while, but just haven't had the opportunity to I write that it. Short. That, is, that is a movie that I would absolutely love to make a feature film, okay. you know, out of. I think a lot of people, when they saw it, felt like it was the opening 10 of something bigger. Um, but yeah, there's there's a bigger world and a bigger mythology there that I'd really like to explore. I will never not be eager to see that movie, <laughs> so I will be impatiently waiting when the time comes for that one. So you were talking a little bit about crafting the script for this. Was there anything that you would call like your break story moment where you came up with an idea and you're like, yes, this is the way to make it Evil Dead, but also put my own unique stamp on it? I think it was a multitude of things. I think when I found the, the heart of the characters and the family, and within that, the metaphor that drives the story, I think that is always the moment for me because that inspires the choices that you then go on and make. And even when the monstrous things happen <clears throat> and the behavior and some of the dialogue with, with those deadites, like it comes out of that kind of deeper idea, that deeper, you know, fear of motherhood, you know, how family can fall apart, looking at some of those theatric or those thematic things. 
And also I, I, when I felt comfortable with that, I felt like then I could just go and have a party with the horror at that point. So that was the turning point in the writing. Once I knew the characters, then it was like, let's get the tools out and have some fun. One of my absolute favorite things about your movie that I think makes it feel different from all the other Evil Dead movies is that you have the grounded, truly scary horror beats, yeah. but you also have that that quintessential Evil Dead humor that encourages people to like share a communal like laugh of relief. So yeah. is there any particular non-spoiler moment where you can kind of talk us through finding that right balance there? I, th I think the I think the already infamous Staphanie moment is probably a good one to look at because what happens is so outlandish. And I think where the audience get the fun out of that moment is they were in on the trick at the beginning. They were aware of the development of this thing. They saw this, let's call it weapon getting made. And then when it returns, it comes out of nowhere, but it's also planted through character in just a couple of scenes before where there's a callback to how this, this thing might offer protection. And then it does offer protection in a very, very brutal way. Stephanie is just absolute genius. Was that always in the script from day one? It was, it was in my head before I even wrote Evil Dead Rise. My little niece, Georgia, who lives in Ireland, my sister's kid, loves horror movies. She's like me when I was her age in terms of the family. She loves horror. She's like, well, now she's 14, but she was probably about nine. And I called into my sister's one day. She loved that I'm telling this story. And she was like, hey, I've got to show you something. And I'm like, what? And she's like, meet Stephanie. So I was like Beth in that moment, except it never ended up at the pointed end. But she has the OG Stephanie at home, which she's going to bring to the premiere in Dublin. So she was the creator of Stephanie, and I have to give her props for that. What I then did with it was turn it into something incredibly violent. <laughs> This is like my type of really wholesome family story yeah, right yeah. now. I adore this. So one of my favorite things about Evil Dead overall is that it, it's kind of like in order to make an Evil Dead movie or a show, you don't play by any rules. You just go for it. But of course, it's in, it's important to you know uh, keep together the mythology to an extent. So of all the rules that govern the Evil Dead franchise, which one was most important for you to uphold? But then also, is there anything about the Necronomicon and Deadite mythology that you were eager to like either shake up or add as a new layer to the franchise? I think, yeah, I think the thing... It's less a rule, but the thing that I wanted to hold up was the relentless entertaining terror, basically, that combination. So when I was working on the screenplay, I had a post note that was just like, make it entertaining. And what I knew what entertaining meant, I meant like, you know, like a thrill ride, a blood train, call it what you want. That was really important because I looked at Evil Dead 2 as so entertaining, like a crawl, once it cr in fact, Evil Dead 2 just starts, you know what I mean? There's not a lot of build, but I always liked that relentlessness. So that relentless horror entertainment was really important. I knew I wanted the book. I knew I wanted the shotgun. I knew I had to have the chainsaw. Those things needed to be there. Um, and I think then from my point of view, it's actually one of the fun things about taking on the Evil Dead is that you don't necessarily need to have uh, perfect rules, because there's a certain kind of nightmare logic at play in that world. So maybe in another horror movie, you'd have to explain how an elevator can fill with blood. Um, in an Evil Dead movie, you don't need to explain that because the force itself that's released is so insidious in nature. It's infecting. I remember thinking at one point how much I could infect the building, the actual fabric of the building itself, and had a lot of thoughts about kind of crazy stuff I could do, but it got in the way of telling the story at that point. But I kept little bits of it with the way the elevator particularly behaves as a kind of character in its own right in the story. Need to swing big in that respect. Otherwise, yeah. what is the point in making another Evil Dead movie? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I love that so no, you much. Gotta, you got to push it out. So you were just talking about like pushing it and going big and creating this like nonstop wild ride. But another thing you do in this movie that really impresses me is like you seem to know exactly when to pull back and take a moment to, to, to build dread and earn those big moments. So are there any particular, again, non-spoiler for now, moments where, you know, you, you purposely slowed things down and gave something a beat before going back to like the big crazy dead-eyed action. Yeah, I think when the true reality of what has taken place is presented to the characters, there's a moment, you know, where the movie turns and it, it goes and it goes again and it goes again and then it goes really hard. And then there's like an argument between the siblings in the story. Although it's not a breath because they're under pressure, but it is a moment where they slightly get to take stock of the new reality that they're facing. And I thought beats like that are very, very important. Or also, there's a very important beat between Beth and Cassie later on, where Cassie asks, asks her auntie, is this a nightmare? And also tells her that she'll be a good mom someday. Those little moments are really important to breathe and to get inside the psychology of these characters. Because without the psychology, without 
you know, them breathing real and you being inside them in some way, um, then horror is just spectacle and nothing else, right? You need to love these people. All I could think about is poor Cassie. I know. My God, you put that poor child through so much. Yeah, there's, there's some therapy <laughs> my, bills ahead. My heart. I'll add one more non-spoiler question before we shift gears here. What was your initial reaction when you first heard that, initially at least, the movie was going to premiere on HBO Max and not in theaters? You know, I was a little bit disappointed at that point in time because I was writing the screenplay as a theatrical experience. Um, but I also understood where we were in the world at the time, and I respect why those decisions have to be made and with certain projects in relation to, you know, home viewing and making sure that, you know, that people, and for me at that point, I was like, as long as people can get eyeballs on this story, I'll be happy. But I never lost sight that I thought it could be a theatrical endeavor. And I believed with COVID and all of that stuff that if the people would go back to the cinema and if people went back to the cinema, they're going to want to watch something fun maybe less existential and just more entertaining. So in my, I always had hope in my heart that those things would line up. And thankfully they did, they did with like the right support from, from New Line and, 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 the, and the people at Warner's. They gave me the opportunity to, to test that movie and to, uh, to see how an audience respond, would respond. And then they realized this is, this is an audience participation, dark room, big screen spectacle. 